Hi, this is Miss Clemmie, and welcome to the podcast on disease pathogens. Now, in an earlier video, we talked about the eight different mechanisms that can cause disease, and today we're just going to focus on this one. All right, below that, let me introduce you to a pretty important antibiotic that treats one of the disease pathogens that treats bacteria. And how it was actually discovered is a pretty interesting story. It's a man by the name of Alexander Fleming, and he came across it um, during one of the World Wars by accident. So what he did was he, he had this Petri dish, and it's covered in this gel called agar. And agar is a really good um, growth medium to grow bacteria on. There's nutrients there. It's just a great place for bacteria want to grow and grow quickly. So he had this auger sitting out, and he probably had a little sample of, you know, some bacteria. And he put it on, he he put some on here, and he spread it all out. And that's what you can see right there. He streak what's called streaking the plate, streaking the petri dish. But it must have been contaminated, and he left it open overnight or a couple days. And he came back to see this. This mold was growing there, and he didn't expect that. And what he saw was that that mold was actually killing bacteria that was once there and he named it penicillin and they were able to mass produce the chemical that the the mold was giving off in order to kill bacteria and it ended up saving the lives of lots of soldiers in those wars because they were able to be treated for these simple infections that they had that before they maybe could have died from so this was a huge game changer, one of the biggest discoveries in all of medicine was antibiotics. Unfortunately, antibiotics cannot be used for every pathogen, like viruses, for example. They're the first one we'll look at, and this is a simple virus right here that you see. Um, basically, it's covered in a protein envelope, and inside is either DNA or RNA. That's it. And these viruses are known as intracellular parasites. Intra means within. They can't live outside of cells on their own. Now here's what this looks like. So the purple kind of rectangle, that's a host cell, like one of our cells. And we can see the virus is, is on top here, and it injects its DNA into the host cell. And then what happens is the virus takes over. It uses all those different organelles like ribosomes and ER to synthesize little other viruses. And essentially it gets to the point where that cell is overwhelmed. It can't hold any more viruses and it lyses. It literally bursts open. And so then it spills out all the other new viruses and they can go on and infect other cells. And the cycle continues. Some examples of viruses that do this, we have measles, um, influenza, the flu virus does this, the common cold, or even as something as serious though as AIDS are all examples of viruses. The next pathogen are prions. Prions are fairly new to research scientists and they're, they're really odd things. They're proteins that have gone bad. That that were once good and then they turn to be abnormal and they usually infect neurological tissue like your brain an example here is mad cow disease so those are prions the next pathogen we'll spend a little bit more time talking on is bacteria bacteria cells are classified as prokaryotes and this simply means they don't have any organelles um, and they don't have a nucleus in which to house that stuff, the DNA. They do have DNA, it's just not enclosed in the safety of the little nucleus nugget. Now we can classify bacteria based on their shape. They can be rod-shaped, called bacilli. It should be a C. They could be circular-shaped, called um, cocci. Or they can be spiral-shaped, which they're called spirilla. Now the tricky thing about bacteria, we can treat them with antibiotics, but some species of bacteria also have spores. And that means that when conditions aren't quite right for growing, that bacteria can save like the important thing, like DNA inside these spores, 
for thousands of years and then when conditions are favorable they can bloom they can blossom again so it's really tough to kill the bacteria that can um, utilize spores a little bit more about bacteria how do they actually infect us well the ones that cause some damage they release toxins and toxins are just pathogenic secretions and what happens if you think you have a bacterial infection, say you have strep throat. When you go to the walk-in clinic to get your throat swabbed, um, they'll do a lab test on that. They'll grow the bacteria and then they'll, they'll treat it with a couple different types of stain. And this whole process is called a gram stain. If the bacteria that was in your throat turns purple, like you can see the little cockeye here, the circular bacteria, um, that's usually better. That's not the bad one. However, if they turn pink, like the rod-shaped ones, the bacilli over here, that means they have a really thick cell wall, and it's tough for us to kill these bugs. And unfortunately, most of the bacterial infections that we have are gram-negative bacteria. Some common diseases that are primarily gram-negative, staph infections, strep infections, anthrax, food poisoning such as salmonella. Now let's take a closer look at those antibiotics. I mentioned Alexander Fleming on the first slide, but let's look in more detail at how this would actually work. So again, let's use our example of strep throat. They cultured your throat, they took a swab, they went in there, ah, and, and took a chunk of cells and they they grew those cells. They streaked them on this petri dish, put them in an incubator, let it grow, decided if it was gram negative or gram positive. But even then, that's not enough. If they know it's gram negative, not all antibiotics work the same. So what they went ahead and did was they put a bunch of different antibiotics on here. They tested type A, B, all the way down through and those little paper discs are coated with different antibiotics and then they put that in the incubator and waited for a little while to see which one would work best on your particular infection and the one that worked the best that killed the most bacteria is E so that's the one the doctor would prescribe for you they would not want to do this one or this one or this one or even for the fact of the matter D um, G or B even though G and B is pretty good E clearly works the best so that's how they decide which antibiotic would work best for you, which one kills the most bacteria. And this is a sample test that they do very often to determine that. The next bacteria are protozoans. Protozoans are moving up in the ladder of complexity. They are not, not eukary excuse me, not prokaryotic. They are eukaryotic, which means that they simply have a nucleus with DNA inside, and they have other organelles like Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, etc. But they're still only one cell big. Here is an example of one of those protozoans. This is an amoeba. And one of the diseases it can cause is dysentery, which is an intestinal infection. Below that one, you'll see another type of protist. Notice they have these little hairs called cilia. So this is a ciliate and a disease that it can cause, oops, sorry about that, is Giardia, another intestinal disease. Over here, a third type of protozoan is called a flagellate. And it is called a flagellate because it has flagella. In this case, it has two. A disease that this one causes, you can see them right here, is something called African sleeping sickness. Um, it can also cause malaria as well. So those are eukaryotic but unicellular pathogens. The next one are also eukaryotic but now they are multicellular. More than one cell big. And an example of this are fungi. Fungi look like plants. There's one in the picture below. Here's another one. Uh, they but however they don't make their own food they're not autotrophic instead they're heterotrophic fungi actually have a kind of weird way of eating they'll 
release enzymes out into their environment, the enzymes will digest the food outside of their body and then they'll absorb the nutrients. So their digestion is external. So they digest and then eat. We eat and then digest. But I digress. Back to the diseases and pathogens. Um, the one you're probably most familiar with is called tinea. That can either cause athlete's foot if it's located on the foot or if it's somewhere else in the body known as ringworm. These are just like fungi because they're heterotrophic and they're multicellular, um, but they are able to move around, whereas fungi can't. Um, and so that was, that's what makes animals different from fungi. But in any effect, they're still pathogens. They're still parasites. And there's tons of different animal pathogens. I just want to bring to your attention a few of the, the more famous ones, if that's how you want to call it. Um, the first one is called trichinosis. And this is caused by a type of worm that's found in, if pork is infected, that's where it'll be found. And if you undercook pork, you can end up getting this disease. Next one is a tapeworm. That's a picture of a tapeworm down here. It lives in your intestines and eats the food you eat, so you don't get as much nutrition. And the last example are any sorts of arthropods. You can get mites, ticks, spiders, scorpions, all of them are considered pathogens to humans. Last thing I want to leave you with are some terms related to disease outbreak. Um, if we're dealing with especially protists and, and microorganisms, vectors are a way that those can be spread. So it's any organism that isn't affected by that particular bug or pathogen, but it can help to spread it. For example, mosquitoes can spread malaria, or they can spread West Nile virus. If that disease is quietly always kind of maintained just below the radar, it's known as endemic, like the flu every year. However, if it spreads really quickly in the same area, that's known as an epidemic, a measles outbreak, a salmonella outbreak, a meningitis outbreak, a whooping cough outbreak. So that's usually the term associated with epidemic is outbreak. It's something that really quickly happens and spreads pretty fast. A pandemic is the same as an epidemic, but now we've expanded the horizons. It's on a global scale, such as AIDS, um, such as this one in the corner. This is a picture taken when the SARS pandemic was going around the world, and it was because our society is so global, flying everywhere, people would wear those masks to prevent the spread of a respiratory pathogen, such as SARS. All right, and the final thing here, um, how do we prevent and control these diseases? Well, I showed you a picture of SARS, you know, just um, putting a mask to cover your face. And a lot of these things just make, make sense. Avoid person-to-person -person contact. Use aseptic technique when you're dealing with pathogens. Um, use proper sanitation if you know pathogens will be present, or even if you don't, when in doubt. Um, avoid opportunistic invasion. If you already have a cut, put a Band-Aid on it so that other pathogens can't get in and knock you when you're already down. And finally, the last thing we can do to try and prevent pathogen outbreaks are to, if it's a vector type of transmission, to try and ward off the, the vector. In this case, if we want to get rid of malaria, let's try and kill the mosquitoes that carry malaria. So they're just some of the tips and tools to prevent and control pathogen outbreak. We looked at viruses, bacteria, and how to treat them with antibiotics, fungi, um, protists, and then finally animals. So there's a, a wide var variety of pathogens for one of the disease mechanisms. Thanks for listening.